so it's a real pleasure for me to uh, welcome Mark Geraci to Wake Forest this morning. Mark is a uh, national leader in academic uh, internal medicine. Uh, since 2015, uh, he has served as the John B. Hickam Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine at uh, Indiana University. Uh, he also wears a number of other hats at Indiana. He's a, a co-director of the Clinical and Translational uh, Science Institute and a, a co-director of a bold new initiative uh, at Indiana in the area of uh, precision medicine. Uh, Mark uh, uh, received his MD uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, in uh, 1987. He did a residency at Massachusetts uh, General Hospital and then he was attracted to the uh, Rocky Mountains, uh, moved to uh, Denver University of Colorado uh, for his uh, fellowship in pulmonary uh, medicine. Uh, he stayed on uh, at Colorado and eventually uh, for 10 years there before moving to Indiana served as uh, Division Chief of Pulmonary Sciences and uh, Critical Care uh, Medicine and you know where he built and led one of the great divisions of pulmonary medicine uh, in the country. Mark has had an amazing uh, career uh, as an investigator and educator. Um, he's received uh, numerous awards uh, from the NIH and private uh, foundations. When you go through his CV and you're looking at his grant funding, the only thing you can say is uh, the grants are uh, too numerous to count. He's the uh, author of uh, 135 articles and book uh, chapters. His research um, has focused on both lung cancer and pulmonary hypertension, in particular, uh, the role of uh, eicosanoids in the biology, you know, of these two conditions. A lot of his research, you know, has involved the development of mouse models of these diseases, but I think what's really most impressive is, you know, Mark is a consummate translational scientist, and he's been able to translate uh, his work uh, into novel uh, therapeutics. He uh, recently uh, led a large phase two trial of a prostacycline uh, analog for the prevention of uh, lung cancer, which was the first study to demonstrate that airway dysplasia in former smokers uh, could actually be reversed. Uh, in addition to his uh, roles at his home institutions, he's played a, in a large role nationally. Uh, he's a former president of the Association of Specialty Professors. Uh, he's been an officer of the Alliance of Academic Internal uh, Medicine. Um, he has also been very active in the American Thoracic uh, Society. Uh, and he, um, for the past 12 or 13 years, he's uh, served as co-director of the Pulmonary Hypertension Breakthrough Initiative which is a national consortium to establish a biobank uh, for patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, he served as an associate editor and on the editorial boards of uh, a number of journals, and he's chaired numerous NIH study sections. So please join me in welcoming uh, Mark Geraci to Wake Forest. All right, well, thanks, Gary. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Um, so I'm really delighted to be here. Gary invited me, and I did my best to get you the Demon Deacon colors. How, how did, did I do okay? <laughs> uh, oh, darn. Uh, and it's hard in the, uh, uh, in the closet to pull this off. Well, the shoes. you got to see the shoes. <laughs> anyway, so we'll get started. This uh, is just a round, uh, uh, around the world of, really 25 years of the work we've been doing in uh, lung cancer chemo prevention. So uh, without further ado, I do have disclosures. They're actually pretty funny. It, it makes a funny story. So I hold uh, what I term a highly limited, restricted, and essentially useless, useless patent on the use of prostacycline analogs in uh, cancer chemo prevention. And it's really a lesson in prior art. And I have to tell you a little bit of the story. So we had a postdoctoral fellow in our laboratory in the late 1990s uh, for one summer uh, from uh, Belgium. When he went back to Belgium, uh, his supervisor said, why don't you uh, tell us what you were doing over there? So he uh, promptly wrote up a short summary about this work we were doing with prostacycline analogs uh, in cancer chemo prevention. He published it in Flemish. 
So it turns out when you go uh, and uh, try to put your stake in the ground for intellectual property, the patent lawyers go through the world's literature and they say, well, this is prior art. You're just doing what Dr. So-and-so did out of Belgium. Um, so it's a very highly limited uh, patent. Nonetheless, much to my surprise, a company licensed this patent from the University of Colorado uh, in 2015, so the year I was leaving Colorado. Uh, as a principal in this agreement, starting this summer, I got $1,041 uh, in a check, and I'll get that three more times. Uh, so that's not going to make me rich, but I think I'll eventually buy a new TV with it. So I will be discussing the uh, off-label use of both Iloprost, as Gary mentioned, and also a recent study we just published on pioglitazone. So the learning objectives are to evaluate uh, the current breadth and uh, morbidity and mortality of lung cancer, summarize pretty briefly uh, the results of lung cancer chemo prevention to date. It's very easy. Nothing works. Uh, and to examine the role of targeted chemotherapy uh, or chemo prevention drugs that we've been working on. So unlike a lot of cancers, we know what causes uh, lung cancer about 90% of the time, and it's uh, cigarettes and smoking, and these are advertisements, Santa Claus smoked. If you smoked, you can turn from the fat guy to the athletic guy, dentists and doctors, and of course the uh, women would rather fight than switch. So a lot of pressure and public pressure uh, in throughout uh, the world wars and immediately after for smoking. <clears throat> that trend is really changing. However, lung cancer continues to kill more people every year than the next four most common cancers uh, in both men and women. So kills more people than colon, breast, uh, uh, kidney, and melanoma combined, actually. So it's very, very problematic. Uh, the other thing is, you, you might say, well, why don't people just quit smoking? That'll really solve the problem. So this is a uh, graph that shows you the more pack years you have over time, this is uh, the increased mortality rate that you can see. So more smoking is not good for you at all. And then when you quit, the risk does fall off. But even if you're 20 years out, the risk of a former smoker is about three to five times higher than the risk of a never smoker. So it's always there. And in point of fact, former smokers now make up the largest percentage of individuals uh, diagnosed with lung cancer. We're going to be talking about this convergence between prevention and therapy. Um, this is meant to demonstrate that we, as a surrogate intermediate biomarker have been studying airway dysplasia and the molecular events therein, and this is sort of the normal epithelium as it moves through World Health Organization classifications of mild, moderate, severe dysplasia carcinoma in situ. And of course, in the chemo prevention world, what we and others have worked to do is to try to drive that process in the opposite direction, and we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll give you, as a baseline, some terminology around chemo prevention. Primary chemo prevention is really measuring the development of risk in a high-risk population. These are exposures, smoking, and the like, and of course, stopping the primary insult is the primary prevention, and it is still the best thing we can do for prevention of lung cancer is smoking cessation. Secondary prevention measures the development of cancer in high-risk Subjects with precursor lesions, we'll spend time talking about that. Uh, that's the space, if you will, where many of our prevention trials have worked. Uh, and then tertiary prevention is measuring that risk when you intervene after there's already been a previous cancer. So I told you all phase three lung cancer chemo prevention trials have failed. And these are not small trials. Uh, these are the physician's health study with aspirin, and you're seeing you know, uh, 50 to 70,000 individuals. It does not impact um, cancer incidence or mortality. A big push in the 90s for beta carotene and retinoic acid derivatives. And importantly, if you continue to smoke and you take either beta carotene or retinoic acid derivatives, you increase your risk for cancer. We don't really understand the biology, but these were trials that were done from the DISH right into humans. There were no models of animals in the middle. 
Uh, and certainly when we went back to say, what are the mechanisms, why is this making it worse, our cancer, our preclinical animal models predicted this result. So we actually did harm in individuals um, in this trial. Minerals, multivitamins, uh, 13 cysts, and acetyl cysteine. Uh, the newest one was selenium. Lots of hype about selenium. selenium. Big trials. Lots of money. All negative. Uh, so a uh, great opportunity for those of you who are in this field. So our goal really is chemo prevention. This is a story that sort of goes from the bench, uh, as Gary mentioned, through the cage and eventually out to the bedside. Everybody has a pathway. This is um, mine. I call it thinking outside the cox. So many of you remember from biochemistry that cyclooxygenases, uh, cox-1 and cox-2, uh, transform free arachidonic acid into prostaglandins. Prostaglandin G2, which then through an isomerase forms prostaglandin H2. This compound can be acted upon as a substrate from multiple different synthetic enzymes and uh, can become different prostaglandins, and now there are over 35. Uh, they've got letters and numbers, C2, E2, all that sort of thing, prostacyclin, or even the thromboxanes. Um, these can then engage uh, seven transmembrane-spanning receptors, and we'll talk a little bit about the fact that uh, they can also engage PPAR uh, elements as well. So first we'll go from the bench uh, into the cage. We do have mouse models of cancer. These mice develop adenomatous changes in their lungs after exposure to selected carcinogens. We'll go over those. These are KRAS mutant-driven lung cancers. That's a pretty good model, but it only accounts for about 15% of the mutations in lung cancer. Uh, early on, when we were looking at genomics and the compatibility of this model with the human condition, uh, Bob Stearman and I and a lot of folks in our group published a um, paper. This is before the days of computers to analyze the data, so we did a lot of this by hand, where we compared human and urine tumor models, both the tumor itself and the adjacent tissue. These are those standard heat maps. You guys are used to looking at these uh, for a while there. They were every, in every darn science article you ever read. But you can see that at a molecular level, these uh, genes that are either upregulated or downregulated are remarkably similar between the human condition and the mouse models. One of our genes that we've been very interested in, prostacyclin synthase, it's the enzyme that makes prostacyclin, was absent in almost 75 or 80 percent of cancers relative to its expression in the epithelium surrounding the cancer. Uh, we went on a little bit later to use a tissue microarray. We had developed an antibody against this enzyme. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate in early stage cancers, these are uh, stage one lung cancers, if you retain any expression of this enzyme, you have a much greater uh, survival, um, and this is out over, uh, out to about 100 months, than if you uh, had lost this enzyme. So this appeared to be a bit of a marker of um, a good prognosis, if you will, to continue to have this enzyme and to continue to make this uh, product. So we had a hypothesis that it's that if we could drive the overexpression of this enzyme in the lungs of these animals, consistently upregulated, if you will, we might be able to prevent against the uh, development of primary tumors. There are currently four pretty well accepted models of giving lung cancer to mice. The first is what's called an initiation promotion model. You give methylcholanthurine in a single dose. Uh, and then followed by repeated doses of butylated hydroxytoluene, a very stimulatory and inflammatory agent to the mice. And over the course of the next 14 or 16 weeks, they develop these adenomas. The second is a little easier. You can give the mice a single dose of urethane. You guys might remember urethane's in general anesthetic. Uh, so you give them a shot, they go to sleep for about an hour, they wake up, and 20 weeks later, they have these lesions. You can expose them to smoking, uh, and the interesting thing about that is if you continue to expose them to smoke, they will not develop the tumors. It's only after uh, about six months of exposure and about four months of withdrawal of the smoke that they then get an increase in these tumors. So uh, we still don't understand why that's 
important, but it's hard to get funded to say, you know, hey, maybe continuing smoking uh, is preventative. Uh, you can apply um, NTCU topically to the skin of the animals. It's a pretty uh, caustic uh, treatment. Uh, the it's very interesting. It's one of the carcinogens, carcinogens found in cigarette smoke. Uh, they don't get tumors anywhere else, but they get lung squamous carcinomas and lung squamous dysplasias. So four models, three are adenomas, one is a squamous. Uh, and I can tell you, we've used all four models in all of our transgenic animals, but I won't show you all that data. You'll fall asleep because it all goes in the same direction. So I was just finishing up my uh, K award. Actually, I'd finished it for a few years. I was in that perilous phase where you're trying to uh, figure out what to do next. Uh, my original K award with York Miller was to examine uh, bobosin-like peptides in lung cancer. Um, this is actually another funny story. And York had this great idea to isolate uh, binding proteins from the lungs of animals, so loading up columns with bobosin-like peptides, pouring homogenates over, eluding them with, you know, sometimes it was a, a gradient of base, and sometimes it was a high salt. Uh, collecting these eluents um, took us about eight to ten months to collect enough eluent to have it analyzed. We take it to the protein sequencer. Back then they were clunky. I think they ran off of steam or something. And uh, we would say they would say you don't have enough protein here for us to sequence. So after about literally three years of doing this uh, on nights and weekends, we had enough to sequence, and um, we got a long couple of reads on peptide. And and back then you would punch those into databases, and four hours later, the match would come up, and it was uh, albumin. So uh, that is a true story, my friend. Um, so I had to move on, and to do this work, I needed to uh, do these experiments. I needed to make the mice. I needed to clone the gene. So uh, we spent a couple of years cloning the prostacyclin synthase gene, and that was all hand done and, uh, and sequenced and all that sort of thing, and, and I needed money. So um, this is where you kind of reach out to all sources available. Uh, and I don't know this, so this is me a long, long time ago, 25 years ago, I think, actually, uh, after I won a V Foundation award, uh, and Dick Vitale came out to Denver uh, with the uh, Papa John's group to award me this, and this is what happens when you try to upstage Dick Vitale. He doesn't let you do that. <laughs> so, um, so after a lot of work and uh, making these mice, we demonstrated um, that these mice, the transgenic mice that overexpress prostacyclin synthase, driven off an SPC promoter that we got from Jeff Witsit's group in Cincinnati, definitely had a dramatic reduction in the number of tumors. Um, compared to their transgene negative litter mates, and importantly, over about half of them got no tumors at all. Really a remarkable uh, uh, finding and made us very excited. So we went back to the bench to say, well, what is happening in an environment bathed with prostacyclin that could be uh, doing this? And what we knew is that downstream from prostacyclin synthase, prostacyclin itself engaged a, seven, a single seven transmembrane spanning receptor coupled with uh, GF, adenyl cyclase was activated, cyclic AMP went up and you got a standard cyclic AMP biological response. What we were becoming intrigued with was this possibility that prostacyclin may engage other receptors and we had some evidence working with Ray Du Bois' group uh, then when he was at Vanderbilt that it might engage some of these PPARs. So PPARs are the per, uh, peroxisome proliferator activated receptors. Many of your endocrine, well, actually, internists and endocrinologists and cardiologists know these drugs as anti-diabetogenic drugs. So fatty acids can do this, and uh, through a lot of work that we and others did, we could we demonstrated that prostaglandins, including prostacyclin, can engage. These are nuclear receptors, PPARs. They heterodimerize with the retinoic acid receptor. That dimerized complex. Sits, sets up a transcriptional program of pro-differentiation, so multiple genes are affected uh, in this transcriptional program. The other thing we needed to do um, was to, to see whether or not these uh, compounds, Iloprost is what we were using, engaged which type of PPAR uh, 
uh, element. So uh, in the lung, the two biggest players are PPAR gamma, also PPAR delta. If we cultured lung epithelial cells with a construct that had a PPAR gamma readout, we were able to demonstrate that at least in lung epithelial cells, it was prostacyclin that engaged and triggered uh, responses uh, to PPAR and, and uh, not a PPAR delta response element. So a critical question was, is this effect going through the membrane receptor of prostacyclin? That's fine, um, but it's a little boring. Um, there is only one receptor, so when this receptor is knocked out, unlike prostaglandin E2, which has four receptors, uh, when this single receptor was knocked out, uh, Shu Naramiya's group in Japan demonstrated that all of the vascular effects of prostacyclin were uh, no longer there. So we did an experiment where we crossed our mice uh, with the membrane receptor knockout mice, which we obtained from Shu's group in Japan. I remember driving out to the airport on my birthday, it was my 40th birthday, it was a long time ago, uh, with my wife to pick up these little tiny mice. Um, and they lived in our house for two days before I could get them over the med center. So we did this cross. This is what I call a no mouse left behind experiment because if you walk through the genetics of the homozygous null knockout animal with our transgenic, you will generate all the control animals that you need. You'll have the transgenic animal with a full homozygous knockout of the receptor. You'll have a heterozygous knockout of the receptor to look at a dose, gene dosing of the receptor. You'll have our straight transgenics. Um, you'll also have receptor null with no transgene and, and the like. So it's really a nice experimental design where you get all the control experiments. So we, along with Rafe Nemanoff and uh, the group uh, in our spore and lung cancer, per, um, published this work now over 10 years ago to demonstrate that that membrane receptor was not necessary at all for this chemo prevention. So these are the lower tumor um, numbers in the synthase transgenic with a completely knocked out prostacyclin receptor. And so it was the, uh, it was the prostacyclin overexpression that drove this. And when there was no membrane receptor, it still occurred. So we had to figure out what that was and how could this be uh, working. And so along with Rafe's group, so uh, Rafe was project two of our lung cancer spore. I was project three. Uh, we've done a tremendous amount of work over the years. Uh, and I'll summarize it by saying that PPAR gamma uh, can act in a tumor suppressor fashion in epithelial lung cells and in when it's transfected into cancer uh, cell lines. And it does it in a very unusual way. It doesn't really affect cell growth. It definitely changes the ability for transformed growth, so the cancer-like property of cancer cells. And then if you take these human uh, adenocarcinoma cell lines that have been uh, juiced, if you will, with a PPAR gamma construct to overexpress PPAR gamma, and the control vector, and then put them into the lungs of uh, aphimic nude rats. You can see with a control vector over the course of about 10 weeks, lots of tumors in these lungs, even mediastinal um, metastases. But in the construct where we put PPAR gamma, very few tumors. You still see a few, the peripheral, but it's nothing like the control lung. So PPAR gamma, um, has an effect similarly to a tumor suppressor. So by way of summary, we talked about the fact that in lung tumors, this prostacyclin synthase is decreased. I didn't tell you about the mechanism. It's not a chromosomal loss. It's actually promoter methylation, much like a tumor suppressor gene, other work that we've published. These mice show a dramatic reduction in tumors if you overexpress it in all four of those models. Didn't show you the four papers, uh, but showed you the first one. Again, we were able to show the prostacyclin is the first naturally occurring ligand uh, in, in, in the colon in PPAR delta. That's re work we did with Ray. Prostacyclin activates PPAR gamma and has tumor suppressor activity. And again, I didn't tell you about the mechanism of silencing, but it's methylation, uh, and that's reversible. So again, you've got to go back and forth there was a drug at the time, there is a drug, Iloprost, 
And it's a way you can actually drug a tumor suppressor pathway. So any of those of you who study cancer, drugging tumor suppressor pathways is a bit of the holy grail. It's very difficult to do. Uh, the nice thing about this is that the gene of interest actually makes a compound, a very uh, important signaling fatty molecule, and there are drugs that mimic this pretty well. So Iloprost uh, was initially made by sharing and then sold to Bayer. It's a synthetic analog of prostacyclin. It can be delivered either IV, orally, or inhaled. In Europe, it was used inhaled in ARDS, still is actually. Uh, the oral compound was used in vascular diseases. This is one of the most potent vasodilators known to man. So uh, it was used in Raynaud's and uh, Berger's disease and other diseases. Um, and now it's approved in the US uh, and in the inhaled version for pulmonary hypertension. The oral compound is a class-rated compound, so it's a sustained release, twice-daily drug, and that's what we partnered with Bayer to do, to do these studies. First, had to do it in the mice. If um, you put it in the chow of mice, you also get a reduction in the number of tumors. Uh, and this is the urethane model, but again, we've done it in all four. You don't get this dramatic effect where none of the mice get no tumors, uh, but you get a really dramatic reduction in the number of tumors. So this made it right for a human clinical trial. Uh, this is a billboard up in Wyoming, and sort of uh, my life, my life's work. Uh, and when we set this up in collaboration with Bob Keith, who uh, grew up in my lab and then is his own great uh, independent investigator, they had done quite a bit of work on the risk factors uh, looking at this intermediate biomarker of dysplasia. So. Entry into this was that you had to have more than 20 pack years of smoking. You had to have airflow limitation on spirometry. This is the single most important biomarker we have in the pulmonary field for lung cancer risk. You see these successful smokers, people who smoke, they're in their 80s, they've got no problem. They also have probably pretty retained lung function. But once your FEV1 dips below 70% of predicted, that trend and that marker puts you at a much higher risk for lung cancer. We also did sputum cytologies on these individuals. Uh, they had to have a moderate or worse grading of cytology on their sputum. Uh, and in our study, they could not have had a family history of lung cancer because even at the time, we knew that might really interfere with uh, our study. Uh, we had published uh, with Sheila Printville's help a very nice study showing that the worse your airway atypia was over time, um, your worse chance of getting uh, incident lung cancer, and this bar is broken. These are down around one, one and a half fold of an increase in the odds ratio. But if you have moderate or more, it's more than 20 fold increase in your odds ratio for the development of a cancer over the next 10 years. This study was designed as a randomized, blinded, uh, study, uh, double-blinded actually, so uh, we went through the registration cri criteria. Individuals got a bronchoscopy at entry. Uh, they got biopsies done, lavages done. We included both smokers and non-smokers because we knew from our work that prostacycline was not going to make the little mice sicker, so we posited that uh, many people uh, continue to smoke despite our best efforts, and we wanted to make sure in this designed that we didn't harm patients. So they could still be smokers, but they were then um, stratified by smoking status. Um, they received Iloprost or placebo. This is, as I said, a really potent drug. Uh, we started off with 50 micrograms twice daily as the uh, dose, uh, dose escalation up to a maximally tolerated dose of 200 micrograms twice daily. After six months, we then perform bronchoscopy again, uh, and we followed them annually for um, uh, all, all the people that completed the study. We had a primary endpoint of endobronchial histology and secondary endpoints uh, in terms of proliferation, microvensal density, and the like. Bronchoscopy was performed in a really controlled manner. There were six standard sites where these uh, biopsies were taken, and then we used autofluorescence bronchoscopy, and any area that looked abnormal also had an additional biopsy. 
We didn't just do this, I realize I shortened this talk, at uh, Colorado, we work with a consortium of lung cancer spores, and so UCLA, Vanderbilt, Hopkins, uh, UT Southwestern, all enrolled into this trial to help us meet our targets. Uh, again, Bob had shown, along with York Miller, that um, using this autofluorescence bronchoscopy gave you increased ability to determine um, dysplastic airway lesions. We also worked with um, Los Alamos National Labs uh, on some of the computational work for this. We did do navigational bronchoscopy, so we knew we were going right back to the places where we took the initial biopsies. This is a demonstration of white light at the carina. Looks relatively normal, but when you use autofluorescence, you can see an area that has more of a darker color. It's often uh, a brownish color, if you will. When you biopsy that, you get really a strange lesion here where you've got blood vessels cursing very close to the dysplastic epithelium. And I'll show you, and what we think is, it's this hemoglobin coming very close to the surf that gives you the difference in color when you illuminate it with a single wavelength of a, a blue light. So our database continued, uh, had within it sites of all the bronchoscopies, photographs of the histology from those. We did karyotyping for uh, genomic instability and known markers in airway dysplastic lesions, so a big uh, database. Wilbur Franklin and our group had um, published with serial sections through these lesions, which Wilbur termed angiogenic squamous dysplasia, that what happens is the blood vessels come up through the lamina propria, curse along uh, in a horizontal fashion in these lesions, so they're very vasculogenic and they also bring that hemoglobin closer. The scoring for the histology was done in the standard blinded fashion by two, independent, two or more independent pathologists using the World Health Organization grading scale. Uh, and the trial we published uh, just about eight years ago. The data are summarized in one of these waterfall plots, and for those of you who do HSR research or outcomes research, these are really what you want to see. Um, so that if you are on the compound and you are a former smoker, you improve your endobronchial histology by any of the metrics we used. Uh, reference sites only, average, worst dysplasia grade, these are all different ways we measured it. If you continue to smoke, this compound will not make you worse, it just will not help you. And the degree of improvement that we see with the compound is about twice as much as we see when we tell people to smoke and rebronchoscopy them two years later, so it's pretty powerful. This is sort of best case scenario. The um, NAV Bronx told us uh, this is where we should be biopsying. This is an individual who had severe dysplasia at this right upper lobe location and wells on compound uh, returned to that lesion six months later, had really normal histology. I told you about the interaction with the PPARs and that we're very interested in that. We cloned that gene, we made that transgenic, uh, and indeed those animals are protected. I gotta tell you, it's not to the same extent as the prostacyclin, uh, but it, it goes in the same direction. We had great supporting evidence uh, that came out just about 12 years ago now from a large VA study that said uh, individuals on TD, TZD agents had a decreased risk of lung cancer, not really changing prostate or rect colorectal, uh, but controlled for all variables, including smoking and the like. They had a lower risk, and if they were African American, a remarkably decreased risk. We don't understand some of the biology behind that. What I will tell you is this PPAR story is a two-sided sword. I won't show you all the data and the numerous papers we uh, put into this, but if you, you've seen the data that if you're putting extra PPAR in those epithelial cells, those cells pro-differentiate and uh, reduce tumor numbers. We did a lot of work with Rafe's group where we, um, we knocked out PPAR in bone marrow and did transplants into uh, other mice, and we were able to demonstrate in the microenvironment, uh, if you stimulate PPAR gamma, it really leads to increased 
growth, and metastasis. So it's a real two-edged sword. PPAR activists on the epithelial side are good. PPAR gamma activation in an established cancer causes the microenvironment uh, to really be pro-metastatic. Um, and this is work over a long period of time uh, uh, that we did. Um, this is some of the work in uh, macrophages. So when we designed the PPAR study, one of the big exclusions was that that person could never have had any previous cancer because we were really concerned about this effect. And indeed, uh, based on some of the work we'd done and some of the work other groups did, the head and neck community launched very quickly into a, a prime, a tertiary chemo prevention. People who already had head and neck cancer and had their resection and were undergoing radiation to get PPAR agonists to make sure or to see if it would reduce the recurrence rate. And we were like, uh, this data came out, and we, we called them, and oh, we're in the middle of the trial, it's a big trial, and still has yet to be determined, but we would predict it actually might be a worse thing if you're doing it in, uh, in a tertiary prevention way. So this is another trial we did. We did it with a very parallel design uh, to that Isloprost trial because we wanted to cross-prepare them. We also had some extra funding that Ruben Tudor and I got in a very large uh, collaborative R01 to look at imaging and a lot of other markers, PPAR gamma activation. And this is the date, October 2019, of the publication of this trial. And this is the data. <laughs> um, this is as negative as it gets. So in, um, in current smokers and former smokers, uh, nothing changes with PPAR gamma agonist stimulation. So again, we don't know. It's important to do these trials, um, uh, but really doesn't um, change the airway dysplasia. We don't know why that is. What else have we been doing? We've been trying to see if we can map out genomic alterations in these pre neoplastic lesions. We've done this by a very clever strategy of brushing the airway and then drawing blood from the same individual and comparing the copy number changes, if you will, uh, using SNP, high density SNP microarrays between the blood, which we believe is more germline, and the somatic changes which we see in the lung. Uh, this is work that uh, Ichiro did in our lab just published a, a few years ago. Very interesting stuff. We can pick up with great fidelity these uh, small changes in copy number, either amplifications or deletions. From this technique, dilutional strategies show us that we can have one cell abnormal in a field of 100 normal cells and still see this signal because the person's peripheral blood is its own control. So we're beginning to map this out in a much more fine way uh, across grades of dysplasia to see what are those molecular events that occur early and late and what does that mean for cancer. We don't know. Colon has a great start on us. They've mapped out all the mutations uh, from the adenomas out to the adenocarcinomas. The other thing that we wondered about is it's really weird. If you have somebody and you do a bronchoscopy on them, they may have a very severe airway dysplasia they may even have carcinoma in situ. This is what is the most remarkable. We don't know what to do with carcinoma in situ in these bronchoscopy spe specimens. And it might be pretty widespread. And when you go back in six months later or a year later, a biopsy in the same area has regressed on its own. It's not like colon. It does not march from sort of uh, adenomatous changes all the way out to a cancer. Some of them spontaneously regress. So we knew that if we were going to be moving forward with this chemo prevention stuff, we needed to be able to figure out if you take an initial biopsy and it's not dysplastic, it can either be stable and stay non-dysplastic or it can progress. If you take a biopsy in an abnormal area, it can either stay persistently or it can even get worse or it can regress. So can we develop molecular signatures that tell what's going to happen based on a time zero biopsy. And this is work that was just published last year, actually, uh, with a large group of us. And indeed, if you do these gene analyses, you can actually find signals of progressive and regressive lesions. 
It really has to do, and I won't bore you with a pathway analysis of context-specific lineage tracing of the epithelium and the microbe environment. So in regressive bronchodysplasia, we see an increased number of these M1 phenotype macrophages. And in the persistent, we see an increased number of uh, T regulatory cells. So I'll wrap up here. Where's all this headed? So island frost class rate was discontinued. Bayer would never make another bit of the compound because it had run out of patent life. Um, we didn't talk about troprostanol. It's another activating agent which doesn't work, and I'll show you structurally why that is. We've been working with inhaled iloprost, and then recently, remember that little company that bought that patent and I get $1,000, $1,041 every year? That company very cleverly went back to work with Bayer really pushed the data with them and said, look, there's an enormous market for this. This is begging for, and the NCI would easily fund, they said they would, a phase three trial to see if this prevents recurrence after early lung cancer. Nothing else works. This is the only trial that's ever been positive. And Bayer said, well, we need more patent life. <laughs> These drug developers are clever. They changed, like, I don't know, a hydrogen molecule or something, and uh, got 15 more years of patent life on the compound, uh, and it's now got a global, a new global uh, uh, license to this company, and um, they're working with the NCI to see if they can do this trial. So the, the bad news is, geez, I, I'm only going to get a TV out of this or uh, something. The good news is it will move forward in human trials, so that's really, really exciting. The other analogs don't seem to work. This is prostacyclin. This is iloprost. They look a whole lot like one another. Troprostanil is another oral agent. It looks very different. Um, and when you look at the structure activity relationship across these eicosanoid receptors, because they are a little bit dirty, they cross talk and cross stimulate different receptors, these eicosanoid analogs are very different in the profile of what they stimulate. So with that, I'm going to um, thank the team, the group at the genomics facility out in Colorado that really helped us do a lot. Again, a spore in lung cancer a large collaborative R01 with Ruben and Bill and I. Lots of people that are uh, now uh, have moved on and do quite successful work in their own right. My current group uh, in Indiana, small but mighty, uh, some collaborators from afar. Uh, and I never end a talk without thanking uh, my family because they are really, uh, over the many, many years, have been very supportive and this is uh, the Familia Geraci, uh as of last Christmas, uh, my son Chris and his wife and their two kids, Nick and his wife Kate and their two kids, my wife, uh, my son, and my daughter. Uh, so I always thank them, and I'll leave it open for questions. That was a really wonderful talk. Um, actually, I had a couple of questions for you. One sort of a uh, specific question, and then another, you know, sort of a little bit more global, you know, question about, you know, your work as a translational scientist. Um, you know, I was wondering, you know, if, if prostacycline pathways have been implicated in other, you know, types of cancer, and also, you know, particularly thinking about epithelial cancers you know, other than lung that have been associated, you know, with smoking and if this might be a more mm -hmm. generalizable, well, certainly, you know, uh, treatment approach. Yeah, it's been looked at more and more um, in GU cancers and bladder cancer. And of course, this tie in with the thiazolidine diones and bladder cancer it remains an interesting conundrum uh, where there, uh, in some formulations of TZD, TZDs, there seems, seems to be maybe an increased incidence in the bladder cancers. When you correct it for smoking status, it maybe doesn't, it's not quite as strong. The lawyers at midnight will continue to take your cases. Um, so there is this crosstalk in other cancers. Uh, I gotta tell you, um, chemo prevention in general is kind of a wide open field. People are off chasing new, you know, tyrosine kinase inhibitors and immunotherapy, and they're trying to cure these really nasty multi-mutational um, lesions. Um, and there's only really a, 
a group of you know under 50 people studying the chemo prevention side of things, the early carcinogenesis side. Um, so it's, it's kind of a great space to be in. Uh, a lot of friends doing a lot of the same kind of work. And we think, boy, it'd be much easier to turn this around at the early stages or even add to a post-chemotherapy treatment with a preventative agent um, that it would be to uh, get in that race, if you will, of uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, immunotherapy, and the like. Actually, actually one other sort of more <clears throat> you know, general career-oriented question. So, you know, your research sort of really embodies the potential of translational science about, you know, moving from, uh, you know, laboratory-based science into preclinical science and then to, you know, clinical trials. I was just wondering, you know, as you've done this, there's a lot of, uh, you know, basic science that's done that oftentimes never has, you know, never goes further, you know, with regard to, you know, clinical studies. So maybe other than never publishing a paper in Flemish again, if there's, you know, lessons that, you know, you may yeah. have learned about, you know, sort of identifying areas of basic science that might have the most applicability, you know, for moving no, forward. No, those are great questions. I would say that if you um, aspire to sort of translation, it, it's a bit fortuitous, but a, a lot of hard work because we knew we had druggable pathways so we had to identify and understand the different compounds in those classes, uh, their activity, and whether or not, frankly, companies would work with us to give us the compounds. So with Iloprost, because it was not yet approved in the United States, we had to cross-reference their IND with the FDA. We had a lot of work at the, we had to do at the level of the FDA. This was a large phase 2B trial. Uh, so um, it, it's a lot of heavy lifting, but we didn't have to make the drug. Uh, which is truly kind of where the cutting edge comes. Uh, we thought about it, uh, but it's a 20-step synthesis. Uh, these are really complicated steroids to make, uh, and, and, and the, some of the efficiency of the steps is down to 80%. So if you guys remember, it's like 99% efficiency. The next one is 97%. You multiply those up to tell you what your ending compound is and how many milligrams you need. You know, our starting amount of compound, uh, which can be purchased from China, was, you know, I got 200 kilograms of starting uh, material and then incredibly expensive. So it's a pathway that's very difficult a medicinal, for a medicinal chemist. So we had that advantage. The TZDs uh, uh, do have the PPAR gamma activation, so we were able to uh, rely on their safety information. But yeah, setting up the IRB, uh, the cross IRB, the cross institutions um, uh, uh, defining and designing these trials in a way that we thought would be well controlled, uh, that we would examine this possibility of causing harm, making sure um, that our animal models didn't, and paying a whole lot of attention to the preclinical animal models, because in lung cancer, they really do tell us quite a bit. They portend a lot. Yeah. So thank you very much for that sort of impressive uh, the path uh, along a, a career of incredible science. Uh, and you touched on something that's maybe a little bit more philosophical, but you illustrated where a compound or a pathway may be stimulatory in one mm -hmm. on one side of the the cell and, and potentially inhibitory in the other, or vice versa. Certainly, in the immunotherapy world, we're le learning that the microenvironment and the timing, and so none of these things are static. They change minute by minute, they change depending on where you are, they change based on what you do to the cell. I wonder if you can comment on sort of that, that complexity and how we're going to move forward when, you know, it's as we might have guessed, things are just much, much more complex yeah. in the, at the cellular microenvironment level. Yeah, so I, uh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> are we going to cure cancer? I, I, um, what I would, <laughs> thanks for that question. Uh, what I would say is that uh, we could have predicted these immunotherapies might have this song and dance. We have enough experience with immunotherapy and cancer, 30 year history of it where it didn't really work very well until we went into the field of the checkpoint inhibitors, but we could have uh, anticipated that, it, that it's not a silver bullet. Uh, it is not a silver bullet. You guys all know that. It, it does add longevity, and they're relatively not relatively non-toxic, so they don't uh, give you as much uh, trouble. Um, but 
We also could have predicted that the single agent tyrosine kinases were bound to fail. We knew that from Gleevec and leukemias, and uh, we knew that if you just pound that mutational driver, uh, one of two things will happen. Either the cancer stem cell, if you believe in cancer stem cells, most of us just call them cancer cells, um, that there would be enough uh, mutational uh, diversity in the original tumor that the resistant clones would emerge or that they would evolve out of exposure to the drug. So, uh, you know, most people that think about this a lot think it's going to be the smart combinations of um, targeting uh, drivers uh, in smart ways that anticipates with forward genetic screening what the uh, resistant mechanism will be. So the first thing I do when I'm working with young cancer researchers, I'm like, I want to use this new kinase inhibitor on this thing. And I'm like, okay, in parallel, take cell lines and completely flood them with this. And or let's do sequencing across the uh, domains and find out what mutations are going to continue to pop up in your patients and kill them. Um, so it's going to be combinations of targeted agents, and it's going to be uh, immunotherapy that's kind of smart. So, you know, the, I think you guys are seeing some real interesting stuff with CAR T cells. And, you know, as they change what the co-stimulatory molecules are on the CAR Ts and the ability to turn them on and off, right, they have go-karts and stop carts and they have suicide cars, um, you know, if they start causing trouble, they, you know, they can give a little bit of tetracycline and kill all those cells off. They're living drugs. They go to your spleen, they go to your bone marrow, they reproduce, they maintain uh, the genetic transformation, you know, for years. So I think it's very, very exciting. I think the idea about the checkpoint inhibitors, while it was great and it sold a lot of medicine, um, Suzanne Topolian was one of the original investigators and uh, she would talk at our cancer conferences and she even would kind of, after a few beers, wine actually, would say, this isn't the magic bullet, but um, it's great that we can help people. Uh, and the microenvironment, as we now know, is really playing a really important role. So you have to pay attention to not only the epithelial biology, but the vascular and the microenvironment and immune uh, part. Other questions? Yeah. My name is Bill Hazard. I came here in 1985 as chairman of internal medicine to build a program on aging. Bill, you taught me in medical school at Johns Hopkins. You were one of my attendings. I was, I was wondering whether that also <laughs> might be part of the story. You don't remember me? I came me? here from Johns Hopkins <laughs> yeah, to, to, to conduct this experiment. But I'm, I'm also going to wax sort of personal and, and philosophical here because you notice that every, about half the audience left. Mm -hmm. Those are the people who, who basically have to come here because they're residents and so forth. They've mm -hmm. got things to do. The people who have stayed are, there are a fair number of the people who stayed who were my first recruits <laughs> here, here, here at Wake Forest. Uh, and and I, what I'm fascinated about is at what point in your life did you discover the thrill of discovery and research, which you continue to do, and oh. while you take on all these other things, I'm becoming a chairman of medicine for crying out loud. Yeah, that's, that's silly. As you know, that's a, that's a silly move. Um, <laughs> you know, I think what I tell uh, young people is that the, uh, as a mentor, you gotta, you got to put young mentees on uh, a project that's going to bear fruit early, uh, and there may be something that's going to be more long-term and maybe their career path. But if you're not giving them, it, it's not got to be a home run, but boy, they got to hit a double, uh, you know, in the first couple of years they're in the lab or you're going to lose them. And so that's important. And that happened with me. Um, but the, you know, I always tell people the high, it's not for everybody. The highs are really high. The lows are really low and they're really far between. I, I, you know, I recently got a grant where you know, I got these two asterisks. That hasn't happened to me in a long time. Like, what the heck? They didn't discuss this grant. So it's, you know, it's a constant battle. It's a constant up and down. And uh, you got to always not only be a mentor, but be open to mentoring. So, uh, you know, I always say that if you uh, show me someone that says they don't need mentoring, that's the exact person that needs mentoring. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a process. Uh, it's not for everybody, but, boy, it's uh, so worth it in the end. And it's really not the science. It's the 
uh, legacy. Uh, there's all those names. That most of them are professors now. Three of them are division heads on their own. It's just wonderful to see. So. Thank you. Thank you.